Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Bob Gray. I see a few, uh, maybe a few new people. I'm Bob Gray, president of the Citizens Club of Springfield. And for some of the rest of you that can't remember that from month to month. Uh, anyway, we have a great program today, and I'm, I'm glad you joined us. Um, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, for those of you that came to the forum we had on the four governor uh, for the Republican nomination, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you caught it on TV, uh, please vote early and often. Um, the um, couple of quick announcements. The, the next program is March 28th, Friday, March 28th, and it will be on reapportionment. Uh, which in essence is redistricting of the, uh, I think it'll just concentrate on the state and Illinois Senate, Illinois House uh, redistricting. Uh, congressional redistricting gets caught in that too, but uh, uh, I don't know whether the referendum, the idea right now is a group is seeking 300,000 signatures to put a referendum on the ballot in November to take, you'll get a kick out of this, to take redistricting out of the hands of the political people uh, and put it in under an independent uh, board of some concept. Uh, California's done this, I think Iowa's done this, Norm, anybody else, I'm not too sure. Anyway, uh, it is going to be quite an interesting program, and, and for some of us at least, uh, we think maybe the, uh, the worst thing about government in Illinois probably is the redistricting process. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, also in April, April program 25th, is the uh, Lincoln Funeral Coalition, Katie Spindell. Uh, you, most of you, again, I, I think understand there is a reenactment in uh, 2015 of the uh, Lincoln uh, when the body was brought back from Washington DC to Springfield and that whole scenario is uh, planned on being reenacted uh, and that'll be our program in April. So anyway, so thank you. The program this morning, I'm just going to uh, call it for my term, Imagine Springfield or a downtown neighborhood. Uh, our program is uh, Chuck Pell, who is with Charles Joseph Pell Architects, Lisa Stott, who is president of the Strategic Communications and Development. They are co-chairs of the Mayor's ESTAT Committee. They can explain that in much more detail. And so Chuck and Lisa, it's all yours. Good morning. Glad to see everyone out this morning and this is some uh, exciting stuff for us that we have been working on for a while and look forward to, uh, to uh, sharing with you. So uh, Bob introduced uh, Lisa and I and we have four other people who are going to uh, speak today. They're going to be on the, the corner of the stage now. We, we may have an issue with the mic, so they have a handheld mic, and if we need to bring them up to the podium, we will. But uh, those four other people who are going to speak today, and not in the order that they're going to speak, but in alphabetical order, Laura Gibson, Chris Nickel, Michael Raps, and, and John Schaefer. And uh, they're each going to uh, uh, add to this discussion that we, that we have uh, this morning. Our, uh, what we have been doing uh, for a while in our mission, and you really just need to look at those words that we've highlighted, creatively connecting the dots. That's really what we are, are doing with our um, ESTAT Now Action Committee. The Action Committee is this follow-up group that has been appointed by the mayor that is uh, working with uh, the report that was given to us by these professionals. We meet the first Friday of every month. Um, this is all posted. This is a part of the Open Meetings Act. Um, you certainly all are welcome. We look forward to having uh, many of you, if not all of you, participate in some way or another. Certainly you're doing that now with your participation being here. And estatspringfield.com, it's very simple. You'll find many of our reports. You'll certainly find our minutes and, and other things about us. But um, let's talk about where it started. 
So every good superhero story has an origin. So that is a picture of Batman, because apparently with fanboys and other people who like to read comics, Batman has the best origin story of anyone. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about Estat's origin story today. And, uh, you know, it's not a superhero feat that we're doing with downtown, but it, it is along the lines of a lot of people having to really care about downtown, just like Batman cares about Gotham City. So I'm going to invite Mike Raps to come up and talk a little bit about where we started with Rudat and, and how we became Estat and who was all involved. Come on. Michael, can you get the... Michael, come, come go come ahead on. and come up here then. Good morning. Uh, I was with uh, the Rudat when it first came into town. It was actually uh, brought here by Karen Hassera back in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, she had learned about uh, Rudat from other people at mayor's conferences and so forth. Uh, I worked early on to uh, bring them to town, show them around. We raised some money to uh, pay for them. This is back around 2002 when they came in. Thereafter, they made a number of recommendations, uh, one of which was to improve Capitol Avenue, which is they accomplished. Uh, they've also made a few recommendations that didn't happen. We still have the Stratton building. But uh, that said, uh, I joined the committee, the follow-up committee on RUDAT four years after that and did that for roughly eight years. And then I have bridged the gap to SDAT, which is a little bit different. It's just sustainability design assistance team. Uh, sustainability is being kind of a buzzword these days, but we focused on the downtown area. Uh, other SDATs, and I worked on one in Fort Worth, Texas, took other approaches. Uh, in that case, they were short of water and uh, so had some other issues that we focused on. But in Springfield's case, it's how do we sustain the downtown? Uh, that's what we're focused on right now, and a number of people in our group, or 20 of us actually, uh, are doing our best to just uh, what, do what we can do to that effect. Who's on the SDAT Action Committee here? here? And there are some not raising their hands who come to every meeting and are helping us out. So just because they're not appointed by the mayor doesn't mean that it's not a larger and larger group. Thank you. So as you can see from the slide, when we first uh, started to participate in this, it was, an, it was a competitive application process. The SDAT is a program of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the American Institute of Architects. Most of us who are architects um, are members of that particular organization. And once uh, our application was accepted, uh, we had a visit by the professionals in May of 2012, and then our action committee was appointed uh, by the mayor in, in November moving forward. And I just did what Bob had done earlier. Let's get this back so that the folks can hear. So we're jumping to the back of the comic book, I guess. Um, what do we really want to get out of this? What is the whole point of these people coming together, working on this? We want to be able to have a vibrant downtown again. And a lot of our application talked about the chicken and the egg, which we all know. We've tried different things downtown. We've definitely had a commercial revitalization, but with all of the state agencies leaving downtown, I think there are 2,600 workers that left downtown in the last decade. You know, we need a different strategy than just straight commercial. So what the SDAT report said was that we need to create a, a downtown neighborhood, a residential neighborhood. So in four to five years, based on study that we'll talk about in a little bit that supplements the SDAT report, we could have a thousand more residents downtown. What would that mean for downtown? It would mean that type of weekend every weekend. And then that would bring more amenities that we all want of movie theaters on everyone's list, maybe another convenience store, different things like that. There would be enough foot traffic to have that. So the downtown urban residential neighborhood will be the way to get us there. So one of the things you hear is, we've been talking about this for years. We've been talking about this for years. True enough. And here are three different reports, um, three different AIA reports. 
but each one of them saw action. The first one was about the pioneers, the Carolyn Oxtabees, who came in the 70s and the early 80s and got work done and built apartments and have people living in them. The second report Michael uh, talked about, the RUDAT, projects happened from that and it still continues to be a discussion and underline of what, of what we're doing. And now we have the ESTAT report that we are currently following up on and, and I think really doing some good work from that we will continue to talk about. So we're at that point um, where are we going to, and I'm going to turn to the slide and ask Lauren to come up and share some things, are we going to continue, are we going to ignore national trends? I, I think that we, we have a great opportunity here. Lauren? So a segment of the population who's likely to be drawn to living downtown is the young professionals that Sangamon County's been trying to attract and retain. Uh, research shows that 77% of millennials, those who were born between 1979 and 2000, plan to live in an urban core. And only don't downtown Springfield in this area has the authenticity, the building stock, and the urban atmosphere that lends itself to being the chosen home for these millennials, who will definitely be critical to the economic vitality of the area through 2050. Um, just to talk about the 90-plus uh, page sustainable design assessment team, the final report, um, the authors do suggest that the housing stock in downtown Springfield, both infill housing and new housing, be created for those pioneers and early adopters. And then the more traditional market will follow once they believe that downtown is a safe place to live and a neighborhood with others like them. So in the meantime, those earlier adopters that we're trying to attract, such as the millennial generation, they want an edgier lifestyle and less traditional apartments. They love the history of old buildings, and they don't want that history obliterated. Um, loft living is definitely at the top of their list. And as an early adopter myself, who currently lives downtown, I agree. Besides the proximity to where I work, what really drew me to living downtown was the uniqueness. It's not just a place to live, it's more of a lifestyle. And I think that's what people of my generation are really looking for. And so according to a March 10th article by Patrick Doherty in Foreign Policy Magazine, American tastes have changed from the splendid isolation of the suburbs to what advocates are calling the five-minute lifestyle. Work, school, transit, doctors, dining, playgrounds, entertainment, all within a five-minute walk of the front door. And millennials, we live in a 24-7 lifestyle. We're constantly on the go. We're constantly involved in something, and we want to live in an atmosphere that reflects that. And we're constantly um, connected to each other through social media, but we also want to live in a place where we can be constantly in contact face-to-face. -face. Um, so from 2014 to 2029, baby boomers and their children, which is the millennial generation, they'll co converge in the housing marketplace seeking smaller homes in walkable, service-rich, service-oriented communities. And already 56% of Americans seek this lifestyle in their next housing purchase. So that's roughly three times the demand for such housing after World War II. And millennials especially, they're renting more than buying, and they're willing to pay more to live in smaller apartments to achieve that urban experience. And right here in Springfield, there's such a large young professional population that could be attracted. So many young people, from my experience, come here to study because but they leave because Springfield's not giving them what they want in terms of a lifestyle. And I really believe that downtown housing and revitalization could be the key to halting the, what I call the brain, the brain drain that we have here. And we believe that the government graduate level internship programs of which I am a part, and also the medical programs provide two of the largest pools of potential downtown pioneers. And so the freedom that created by new intermodal and rare opportunities will further attract anyone seeking housing of all types in proximity to the action. Great, thank you, Lauren.
I think we need to do a better job of introducing the other people who come up here. Um, Lauren is a graduate public service intern, like she said. She works at the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. She's kind of at the crux between um, energy and housing is a lot of what she works on. She is our representative on the SDAT Action Committee for the Young Springfield Professional Network. So she has her fingers in a lot of places. She knows the pulse of her age group, and she's been a great asset to our team. And then Michael Raps, I didn't really give you that good of an introduction either. Uh, Michael is a professional engineer here in town. I'm sure many people in the room know him. And he's also, as he said, been on the RUDAC committee and the SDAC committee. So I think that the very important thing to talk about next and really what we want to highlight, and you've, you've heard about some of this, is the, the demand has been proven. Before it was anecdotal, before someone said, we have these 12 units, they're filled, wonder if the next 12 can be filled. Well, here is a report, and we want to thank the, uh, the Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce for its uh, funding of this report done by uh, Bowen National Research. So I'll go through the report a little bit. Uh, they did a little bit larger area. They looked at a, a larger area than the SDAT report itself. So they expanded the downtown to include a little bit more uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th Street uh, around Passfield House. So you can see right there the, um, can, do you want to point out where the old state capital, okay. The old state capitals essentially at the cross of those quadrants. Okay, so the old state capitals where the where the cross happens. They, the other great thing that they did for us is they, um, in addition to other parts that we'll be talking about, they gave us 33 best bets for redevelopment. So those dots on this map show 33 places that the research firm Bowen National Research out of Ohio told us could be the first thing we should do as far as development. So it's a great way to sell to developers and other people, whether they're local or regional, what we have available. So this is a, you might as well tell them. Well, you can see that one of the first slides that we showed you was our SDAT study area. And so this is the two overlaid so that you can see how they're essentially similar. And that's, that's very important to, to understand. So the, the report, there are three things that we want to really share with you from the report. One has to do with rental housing, the other has to do with for sale housing, and then the other has to do with students. And so you can see from uh, this particular slide that um, in terms of the, the range of income uh, from the top slide to the uh, potential units, so three to 649 uh, units in that uh, less than 25,000 income, all the way to uh, 38 to uh, 76 units for those making 40,000 plus. And this is um, a, a four year, uh, this is a look at four years into the future without any other changes. So if, if the economy gets worse, those numbers get, uh, are lower. If, if the economy continues to improve and does better, those numbers could in fact grow because it's done without, without any changes. <laughs> Uh, the, other, the other part of the study that they analyzed was uh, ownership, housing downtown, a condo, and what they found was that there are really the market downtown for condos is really only for people making two hundred thousand dollars or more. They think that we can do forty eight condos in that uh, salary range for downtown, but there's really nothing below that. But the one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand range is pretty much non-existent. Um, and below that is non-existent. So you can kind of see, I think our condo market needs more of the rental market to come faster before that can really be successful. So in, 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 a, in, a, in, our, in our market, in our market, we have uh, nearly 15,000 students um, from all of the institutions. It's huge. And there currently is not any housing specifically geared towards them. And so there, there is definitely opportunity there. Um, the opportunity is in the last bullet point with up to 160 beds serving all of those schools um, with 40 graduate, 40 undergraduate, and then 46 from the medical community. The, uh, do you want to introduce John? Okay. She was doing such a good job of reintroducing. I wanted her to do that. Uh, 
Um, that's right. I'd like to bring up uh, John Schaefer um, to to talk about um, uh, livable communities, walkable communities, the importance of the sustainable aspect of, of what we're doing. John? John is um, a lead accredited professional, also a colleague of mine, a member of the American Institute of Architects. And you probably see John's office um, uh, also in the Illinois Times office when you come into town on 6th Street. Thanks, Chuck. So the American Institute of Architects developed uh, 10 principles for livable communities, which I'm going to touch base on a little bit. And uh, it ties into, I guess, a couple main themes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think those themes would be choices and options. And downtown fits the bill for a lot of that type of stuff. I think a lot of us uh, in the audience would remember a, a much more vibrant downtown, and that's part of what uh, sustainability is. Downtowns, by their very nature, are very energy efficient. You've got a lot of options available. Part of this whole uh, geared of the of the SDAT is to introduce more housing to make a more vibrant downtown space with more options. Options being housing options, retail options, shopping, restaurants, commercial space, transportation being one of the huge ones. I think one of the biggest energy efficient features we can see about a downtown area as opposed to some suburbs or something like that is the ability to be able to walk, the ability to be able to ride a bike, just the closeness, the proximity of places to each other uh, as opposed to having to get into a car and, and drive for a period of time, having a lot of land space to park that car, whereas here mass transit works better, uh, bicycles can work better, walkability, all those types of things can really, really increase the, the livability and the vibrant. So one of my personal passions is to um, make our area, our city, a, a better place. And I think the development of a downtown as a, as a city's living room, so to speak, is huge. I think one of the main things that, that we uh, forget about as a, as a community, potentially, is what do we have unique as a, as a space in uh, versus other urban areas, and that's our downtown area. That's what makes Springfield unique. Everybody has a Best Buy area. Everybody has a, a suburbs and all that type of stuff. I think to develop our downtown, making vibrant spaces, a lot of options, a lot of choices and everything is a, is a really good way to do it. And, and looking back at the past and picking some of the best items from the past and the future, I think will attract people like Lauren and that to stay and add. It's a win-win situation because we can add to the economic vibrancy of our town. We can uh, increase options. We can have choices. We can have a much better city. I think that's, uh, in a nutshell, what I think some of the sustainable aspects of what we are about are. Thank you, John. So our action committee, over the course of probably the last four months, um, it is um, as perhaps you'll note, um, a little heavy with architects is because it's a program of the American Institute of Architects. Many of the architects are very interested in the things that we're talking about. So we asked the architects who were uh, members of our action committee as well as other uh, members of the American Institute of Architects who weren't on the committee if they had uh, projects that they had uh, perhaps in a drawer somewhere or something that they wanted to imagine. And so six different uh, firms imagine nine different projects and those are um, uh, along the, uh, the wall here and we hope um, after we meet that you have a chance to uh, to check those out and we hope that uh, some of the architects are here perhaps can stand by their boards answer any questions uh, about those about those that particular vision this is a, a site plan that shows the nine locations for those uh, those particular those particular projects And you can see that in relationship, again, with one of the, the primary study area for the housing study. And the, the upper left quadrant, the, the primary study area that the, that the researchers looked at, they divided their study area into four quadrants. So the upper left, which is uh, in, into the medical district, probably became the most, um, the, the area that they focused on is, as an area that uh, would probably want housing or need housing first. Um, this is a, um, a chance for me to uh, introduce Chris Nickel. Uh, Chris Nickel is uh, in the wind energy business. He is also a resident of downtown and is a, uh, um, uh, now a developer downtown. And I want him to uh, uh, come and tell his story. Chris? You don't want my story. 
<laughs> Morning. Um, I sort of liked her uh, analogy of Batman, I think, um, only because by day, I guess I'm a developer um, of wind farms, and then in the evening, I, of course, have to convert, and I become a developer of downtown residential space. Um, I came by it, um, I suppose I'll say honestly, it, it, um, I hadn't had this vision for, for many years, um, but um, came by a building near to downtown, which I'll show a picture of um, a, minute, uh, a minute from now, and sort of, it sort of grew into um, realizing the potential in the area, and, and it went from there. Um, this is uh, the building on the left is uh, my wife, Aisha, is here. She and I live in this with our nine-month-old son. Um, we purchased this building uh, from the bank, actually. The upper stories already had eight units built in them, a variety of sized units, um, which I have found to be um, most likely the, the best approach in that you need, um, as is mentioned before, you need to provide some variety. This building has everything from 600 square foot to 1,600 square foot units in it. Um, we, uh, the first floor was vacant at the time. It was intended for commercial space. However, we didn't have much luck with that. Um, as, as, as probably most of you know, there's a lot of um, open commercial and office space. <clears throat> However, every time we had an opening for a residential unit, my phone rang off the hook. So we had the benefit of this building being essentially five or six foot off the surface. When you walk into the building, you have to go up steps. This allowed us to provide two more um, residential units on the first floor it, uh, and it also provides privacy from the sidewalk. Because of that elevation, you can see these windows here. We were able to put windows in the bedrooms on the first floor, but they're high enough that passerbys can't see in or tap on the windows. Um, <clears throat> so, that, so we are now um, mostly complete, complete with that building. We have one more space in the rear of the first floor that we may develop, um, but we're most likely going to leave it similar uh, to the way it sits right now. Um, the next uh, one shown there is uh, Cafe Moxo. I'm sure all of you know uh, where that spot is, most of our favorite uh, place for lunch. Uh, this is a, a recent purchase just in the fall. Um, and the upstairs has been underutilized for as many years as I, I can recall. Um, we actually just have our first draft of the architectural plans for that. There will be two townhouse style units that face Adams, so the windows that you see will all be utilized um, on, in a, in a two-story unit on each side. Uh, the third floors of this building are only about a third of the entire depth of the building, so the third floors are small. So the rear of each second floor will be another unit, so there will be a total of four units added to this building. Um, we Having finally seen the, the plans from the architect, there's some, some excitement on our side there. Um, we're, we're excited to get those moving. Hopefully we'll have those done by the fall. Um, this one on the left is, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll call it my, what I mentioned earlier, my, my first taste of downtown. Um, it's, as far as ownership is concerned, this is at 401 West Monroe, which I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the area. It's only a, a block, a uh, block and a half west of the Capitol Complex. This building, along with one at 715 Monroe we bought together as a package, um, was already complete. However, it needed some updating. Um, and we, f we found through that process, again, the, the, f the flood of calls we got when we had units ready. Um, so th this is the building that essentially proved to me everything you've heard from the other speakers today, is that there's a demand, and it's a demand that's not being met. Um, whenever we have an opening in this building. And admittedly, um, the units are a little bit smaller and a little bit lower rent, so I think that really opens up the, the audience that we have for people who appreciate the, um, the units that are available in this building. Um, the, the next one uh, listed as Bridge Jewelry, as you can see that picture I, I believe is circa 1960. Um, we also just purchased this one. Um, <clears throat> the, the Bridges Jewelry Store, as you probably know, has closed. It's currently vacant. Uh, Bentos, uh, another one of my favorite lunch spots, is, is on the other side. Um, and the upstairs of this, similar to Cafe Moxo, the, it's three stores, three stories, but the third floor is very short. So we plan here one unit on the third floor and then two units on the second that parallel each other running east and west. Um, something that uh, 
it, from from a developer look, looking at buildings downtown, the the things that we look for, the things that what makes a building work for us, uh, we look for windows. I think everyone kind of realizes, especially with the new codes that are in place, for if you want if you want a lot of bedrooms, you need a lot of windows. Um, this, the bridges building, for example, it is building locked on the north, but it has windows on three sides. Um, Cafe Moxo, it's been a challenge because there's only windows on the alley and on Adams. There's no, it's, it's building locked on both sides. Uh, the first building I showed you that, that I live in, windows on three of four sides, and they're the three large sides. Uh, this building, obviously, there's nothing but parking lots around it, plenty of windows. Um, from, uh, from a developer standpoint, and I know the architects that are in the room realize the challenges that are there, so that's one of the, one of the things we look for. Another thing is, is viable first floor space. Again, I mentioned with the building that we live in, um, we essentially, we eventually turned that into residential. So finding a building that has a viable first floor is helpful for us. Obviously the Cafe Moxo viable first floor candidate. Uh, the Bridges building Bentos is there, has been there for a while. We like that, having a first floor uh, space that's usable. So um, I guess to wrap up, um, I agree with everything that was said before, and my experience through these developments has have proven all those things to me. Uh, there's definitely a, a demand, um, and uh, my business plan and the business plan of my partners, I, I say we a lot, I have different partners on most of these projects. Um, we, we, we believe and we see and we're, we're feeling this move, and so hopefully we're, uh, we'll be in front of the curve and be able to provide some spaces for people. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. I think one of the things that Chris told us too, and is that uh, you know, for instance, you probably saw Chris on the cover of the SJR when he was walking through the uh, the Bridge Jewelry Building. The uh, um, from from that article, I think uh, no less than what three bankers called you. So I mean, you know, the, the clearly clearly there is uh, uh, money to be loaned um, on these projects uh, uh, if the if if things work out, and and clearly uh, interest. Transit-oriented development, and, and everything has to have an acronym, right, Norm? Is Norm still here? Um, TOD is attracting capital right now. Sustainable development that we've been talking about is attracting capital right now. And we've talked about the demand is here now, too. So simply, vacant buildings, housing market study, never been a better time. So join us right now. Thank you. We made our presentation brief so you could do what you really want to do and go and look at all of the designs and talk to the architects about their designs. So we have about 15 minutes built in for that, and then we'll take some questions after that point. Why don't you take questions first? We will take questions now. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. So how your plan is to attract uh, people to downtown to live there so they will spend money there and will the energy from that is going to revitalize downtown, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yes. The more people living downtown, the more people spending money downtown, people who are looking for that urban lifestyle, downtown is really our only option for that. So. Uh, then, uh, with the uh, uh, millennials, uh, their lifestyle um, uh, and, and uh, includes social uh, involvement, uh, eating out, going out, uh, having, going to bars, to eat, drink, and just uh, things like that. Is that what is meant by that? Uh, millennials are a, a different breed from the generations that have come before them. They are crazy. They don't apparently want to drive. You know, when I turned 16, it was huge to be able to drive a car. They don't really care about that. They do look for more communal spaces. Uh, they don't necessarily look for bars all the time. Sometimes they want a coffee shop. Um, but they definitely look for a more urban experience. It's happening all around the country. What's going on with the Cafe Brio building? Rick's not here, is he? I don't know if he's here or not. Uh, uh, Rick Lawrence, who owns Siciliano Construction, has uh, purchased uh, that building, the, the Ferguson building, as well as the Booth building, the next tallest one to the west. And um, you've seen the, the, 
the facades that were put on those buildings come off, and so it's in the the the, the process of being cleaned up, as I understand, and the. The Ferguson building, which is the building on the corner that you referred to as the Brio building, is within our historic district, and uh, the historic district is in the process of being enlarged, if I can sort of say it that simply, and um, hoping to encompass then the Booth building. And when uh, buildings like that are within a historic uh, uh, district, they then could become eligible for 20% uh, historic federal tax credits, which could be a big deal to the project. I know he's doing the booth building first. That was his plan to turn that into about 20 apartments, I think. That was my question. Yeah, and then move to the other two buildings. Question? Quitty, the colleges have uh, plans to increase their, uh, their uh, print downtown? We have had wonderful conversations with UIS and uh, SIU about the fact that they have so many uh, graduate students who are doing internships downtown at state offices and of course the medical residents 200 medical residents residents about 250 graduate students every single year so we've been having wonderful conversations they have actually um, you need to talk to Larry Quinette about the student housing um, approach imagine project over there because they've actually talked with him and um, signed some letters of support so if we can make that happen, they would have their students living there. Question? Um, one, one. Go ahead. Um, I've lived in the downtown area since I moved to Springfield in 1983. And I don't recall at any point in that time a survey of those of us who live downtown what we would like to see. The first year I moved to the St. Nicholas was 1992, and I, it was a fairly mild summer. I slept with the windows open, the train less than half a block away, and then someone went and got themselves run over by a train, and the, uh, the suppression of the whistle was lifted. Now it's unbearable. And then, during the time between 92 and 2005 that I lived at the St. Nick, uh, motorcycles exploded in popularity. So where do you think the motorcycles go at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> they come downtown, so, okay. <laughs> ask, ask, ask us, the people that live there, what, what we'd like to see and what's going on. Well, that's probably a good segue to tell you that um, our livability uh, work group is uh, meeting here um, right after this, and so they would love for you to stay and, and talk about some of your ideas with them. And the other thing is you probably know the Third Street safety improvements are going to mean that the, the train sirens aren't going to be those going In anymore. years. No, that will actually happen a lot earlier. 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> a lot earlier. Norm? A year? <laughs> the question she's addressing is the improvements on the Third Street Rail Corridor. Not the, the, not the consolidation. Or any discussion on 10th Street. And related to, I, I don't know what the comment is related to suppression of the, the engine horns in the past. I'm not aware of that ever being the case. By law, given the nature of that corridor, I think the trains have to blow whistles within a quarter mile of every crossing. So part of the advantage of what's going to go on Third Street is least the same. You have to do safety improvements and to close certain areas, so that would be a no point zone on Third Street, and that will happen much more rapidly. Yeah, it's before the consolidation, which. But, but please stay. Slides talking about the Brudat and the Prudat 
and I was on the National Committee, that's expert was coming from the AIA. Uh, sociology of the city was one of the things that was discussed. Uh, this would have been called a screw dash, would they? They changed that. <laughs> sociology of the city says, well, fine, you can look like you know, this conversation is really coming out as shelter. Uh, but when you, and this gentleman who said he's living with his, his family, a, a baby or, or a small child, I presume, uh, raising a child on the third floor in downtown Springfield without a car is sort of a screwed out idea. I mean, you don't actually identify what, what people are looking for. And so we're really looking for 100. Well, one of the suggestions that I really carry around with me is, the biggest mistake in the world is bringing all the freight trains through Springfield and cutting it off to the two to 46 per day, and those things can be as long as two miles long. That's current information for the people who are designing it. Uh, and so we're either going to split the town of half of that one, but at the same time, you have no place for somebody who has a child to go out and sit in sunlight where there's grass and everything. A small part of the downtown area will be a major improvement and then, of course New York City is a perfect example area that Central Park would go to all the major communities and where they've got people who are living in the high rises you've also got the recreational area and uh, there was a time where when I, I participated in several of those events and, uh, people could not find a place to take their their kid out and sit there and be sprinkled on because there's no grass, no water feature, or anything like it. That's a piece of ground. If we extended the idea of we've got a governor's mansion that's beautifully landscaped, that block now that's vacant in there could turn into a water feature park with with a, a place where most of the people who have small children or even even old enough to, to get out into the sunlight. That's it. But otherwise, you you come over, you get your little little department and say. Boy, I live downtown now. What do I do? Turn on the television set? Or do I walk to someplace else? Because there's not going to be any place to park. Sociology of the city is the key plan. So I hope that SDAT, through that, it's a chance to study a little bit further because it's, it's not shelter only. You've got to have a, a social relationship that's beyond the bar. Yeah, the ESTAT report did look at green space a lot and, and made recommendations in that area. We just felt like we were taking off what, you know, the bite that we could chew first with housing being such a big bite. But it all it all interlocks, as you're saying. Well, I agree with you. I think that the, the green space is something that should be an afterthought, should be right from the yeah. beginning. This is going to be a livable thing. You can go out on the street walk down and sit on a bench and be under a tree and watch other mm -hmm. people enjoy their life. Mm -hmm. That block right across from the governor's mansion it should end up in a green space and it's got a water feature. Mm -hmm. Super. Uh, I want to make a couple of quick announcements and then we'll break as, as proposed. This will be shown on WSEC uh, Channel 8 on Thursday, and I'll get a note out on this too. Thursday, March 6th, Friday, March 7th, Saturday, March 8th. Uh, the first one's noon, the second one's 8 uh, a.m., it looks like, and the third one's noon. Also, uh, Channel 4, Access Springfield, shows all of our programs on Tuesdays, uh, 6 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, and 11 at night. So I want to thank Chuck and Lisa. You have anything else you want to wrap? And then... Uh, the, there are, as we said, architects here, drawings here, and uh, please visit. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you.